Last time we stated the theorem of the Kraft Macmillan inequality. And in this video, we're going to give a proof of part A of Macmillan's part. So the proof we're gonna do is due to Jack Crush, and it's a marvelous little proof. It's one of those proofs that seems to just wander off into never, never land, but then it magically reappears behind you and taps you on the shoulder and just hands you the result. It's quite remarkable. So for the proof, I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation, which will be useful later on as well. I'm gonna use this x subscript one through k for a string of symbols x1 to xk, or what is essentially the same thing, a sequence x1 through xk in the set script x to the k. So script x here is as usual our source alphabet, and this x to the k is the set of all sequences of length k from that alphabet. Now, we're gonna break up the proof into two parts. Case one will be when our source alphabet is finite, and then we'll consider the countably infinite case. So first, let's, so the, there's gonna be yet two parts of case one, and first, let's think about some, the following situation. Let's say we have two integers, k and s, with k strictly positive and s non-negative. And let's think about the following set. Let's think about the set, let me use my yellow again, Let's think about the set of all sequences, x1 to xk, this is using our notation here, with the following property. All such sequences for which the sum of the lengths equals s. So this is our integer s. And this is the sum over i from 1 to k. Think about that set. I claim that the size of this set, the number of elements in this set, is less or equal to b to the s. So b here, so notation, b is the b in our b array code, and I'm using l for l, l equals the size, the, the length of the code word for c of x, for, for x. So in part a, our assumption is that we have a uniquely decodable b array code, and we're trying to prove that this, this, that, this, that this inequality is satisfied. Now, I will leave it as a exercise for you to prove this fact. It's not a hard exercise. This will be exercise. And basically the reason why is because if you think about, you know, we have our code C here, and it's uniquely decodable. So the extension of C, C star, takes x1 through k and gives us some element of A star. It gives us a sequence. And, right, and the sequence that it gives us is Cx1 up to Cxk. So the length of this thing you were to look at the length, that's equal to the sum of those lengths, which is, by the definition of, of L, that's the sum of the L of X I's. So for any element in this set, this is equal to S. And, and in, or in other words, C star X1 through K is not only in A star, it's actually in A to the S, because it is a sequence, it's an encoded sequence of length S, and each element in the encoded sequence comes from the code alphabet A. So, and, and then the, the final fact is that the size of A to the S is equal to B to the S. And you need to, in order to show that, uh, that this inequality holds, the, the key fact is that C star is a one-to-one -one function. So use that C star is one-to-one. -one. And that is the definition of a uniquely decodable code. So that's where unique decodability comes into the proof, is using the fact that C star is one to one. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through the details of that. It's, it's a pretty straightforward thing. But now we're gonna get to the interesting part. So we're gonna use that fact to prove the inequality. So our goal, remember, our goal is to prove that inequality, and let's rewrite it in this way. Let's 
flip the the that fraction and so we'll just put minus instead of so 1 over b to the l of x equals b to the minus l of x and our goal is to prove that this is less or equal to 1 so let's do something very out of the blue let's just take this quantity and raise it to a power let's just raise it to say the kth power l of x i Oh, sorry, that should be just L of X here, not L of X, I, L of X. And now I'm going to have in a bit, so that's L of X. So let's raise this guy to the kth power. So what do we get? If we multiply everything all out, we get a sum over X1 up to XK, and each of these sums is over all the x is in script x in our source alphabet. And when we pull everything together, we get b to the minus l of x1 up to b to the minus l of x k. Because if you think about what it means to multiply all this out, you have k factors here. And when you multiply it out, you're going to take one term from the first factor, one term from the second factor, and so on, one term from each factor up to k, multiply those together, and that gives you a term in the overall sum. And if you think about this for a minute, if this doesn't, isn't completely obvious to you, if you think about for a minute, then when you multiply this all out, you'll get exactly this. Okay, so now let's rewrite this in a slightly more compact way using our notation from above. This is the sum over all sequences, x1 to k from x to the k. And of course, we can pull together the exponents here into the sum of the exponents. This is a sum from i as i goes from 1 to k. And now let's think about this, this sum here. Well, we're assuming that x is finite, that our source alphabet is finite. So what so what does that tell us about this sum? Well, it tells us something which will be useful. It tells us that the sum, let me use the, sorry, this sum is less or equal to, this is going from one to k, k times L max, where L max is equal to the max over all x's of l of x. Since x is, since this set is finite, since our source alphabet is finite, then there is such a maximum and it's, and it's a, it's a finite number. This is less than infinity. So that's the key part where we use the finiteness of x to show that l max uh, is a finite number. And now how can we use this? Well, each term in this this sum out here for each term in this sum the exponent has a particular value for each term in the sum the exponent has a particular value and for all the terms where the exponent is the same those the terms are the same so let's group them according to like terms so we can group them according to the value that the exponent takes and the exponent is going to go, let's call it s, it's going to go from 0, it, can, it can't be negative, it's going to go from 0 up to the largest it could be is this k times l max. We know that's an upper bound. So we're summing over the values that the exponent could take, and then we have to sum over all of these guys that have that particular exponent. So all of the x one through k's such that the sum of their lengths equals s and then of course we have this same thing in here so we're just breaking up this sum into these two different parts now what do we know about this term inside the sum well what, here s is fixed every every element of this inner sum think about this inner sum Every element in this inner sum 
has exponent s, right? That's exactly what we're summing over here. We're, we're fixing s in the outer sum, and then we're summing only over those sequences that have that exponent. So this equals, so this is just exactly b to the minus s. And that doesn't depend on x, uh, you know, this sequence, x1 to xk, so we can pull it out. We can pull it out of that sum. So maybe I'll switch colors. This is a little bit here, change things up. So now we have the same thing on the outside, but we have pulled out b to the minus s, and we're left with this inner sum. x1 to k, such that the sum of the lengths equals s. And it's just one. It's just one inside. So this inner sum, it's just the number of elements x1 through k that, are, that have that sum. So this is the sum over s, b to the minus s. The number of x1 through k's such that the sum of the lengths equals s. And this is exactly what we observed in part A is bounded by b to the s. This is the set of all these sequences x1 to k that sum to s. And so now let's apply our bound from part A. So let's use our bound, switch colors again. Our bound told us that this is less than b to the s. So we have this whole thing sum over s, 0 to k l max, b to the minus s, b to the s, which is, of course, just 1. And so we get that this is equal to k l max plus 1. All right. So we got an upper bound for this quantity taken to the kth power. And that was kind of remarkable because we just, you know, just out of the blue, took this to the kth power, and we got this nice bound for it. So what does that tell us? Well, let's give this thing a name now. Let's call this something. Let's call this, let's call, this is some number, right? You know, we have, you know, b is just some number, and we have all the set of all of our lengths as x ranges over the source alphabet. So this is just some number, you know, given our code. Let's call that number r. So this equals r to the k. So now what we have, we have shown that r to the k is less or equal to k l max plus 1. And we would like to show that this is less or equal to 1. And this is, of course, just r. This is r. We'd like to show that r is less or equal to 1. So how can we use this? Well, let's suppose r is not less or equal to 1. Let's suppose r is greater than 1. Well, if r is greater than 1, then this is something greater than 1 to the kth power. And this is k times, you know, some integer here. But what is k? Well, k is just some arbitrary positive integer, right? K, k was just, we just picked any integer k and this, and this held. So this is true for any k positive integer, etc. And so as k is getting very, very large, as k goes to infinity, r to the k, if, if r is greater than 1, r to the k is going to infinity exponentially fast, whereas k times l max plus 1 is just going linearly to infinity. So if r were greater than 1, then when k was large, this, would, this inequality would not be satisfied. So if, if, if r greater than 1 then r to the k would be greater than l max plus 1 for k large. And that would be a contradiction, and therefore r is less or equal to 1, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Check. Very nice. So that proves case one, when our source alphabet is finite. I love that proof. That's so neat.
Okay, so what about when x is infinite? How can we, what can we do? Can we fix things? Can we still do it? Case two, x infinite. Well, remember now x is always going to be countably infinite because we're dealing with a discrete memoryless source. That's our, our assumption. So it's countably infinite at least. And so let's write, we can, let's, we may as well just number the elements one, two, three, and so on. So let's go ahead and do that. And so what we want to show is that we want to show that this sum, sum over all x, b to the minus l of x is less or equal to 1. And still, you know, it, uh, our assumption is that we have some uniquely decodable code c for all of these infinitely many source uh, source symbols. So let's rewrite this in a slightly different way using this numbering of, of our source alphabet. This is the sum as x goes from 1 to infinity, b to the minus l of x. And what is the definition of this infinite series? Well, it's just the limit as n goes to infinity of the finite sums of the, the partial sums. So now we, are, we have reduced things down to a finite case. Now we have just a finite sum here. We have finitely many lengths. And what if we look at the, if we say, maybe we call x prime, or maybe we'll call it, I don't know, x, well, we'll just call it x prime. x prime, the set one up to n. Well, there's some, you know, we have our original c here. And just applying C to just that subset, we get some code words, C1 up to Cn. And now it's pretty clear, if you think about it for a moment, that if C was uniquely decodable for this whole set, then it's certainly uniquely decodable when we just restrict it to this subset. These code words will also give us a uniquely decodable code for this subset. And therefore, this finite sum here is less or equal to 1 by case 1, by case 1. So this is less or equal to 1. And the limit of a bunch of things which are less or equal to 1 is less or equal to 1, less or equal to 1. So that proves that the sum in the infinite case is also less or equal to 1. And therefore, we have proved part A of the theorem. We have proved that. We have proved Macmillan's part. For any uniquely decodable b -ary code, the sum of 1 over b to the lengths is less or equal to 1.